Beacon we start up, and um, the idea came um, after a meeting in Sweden organized by Lars uh, last year, and uh, one of the topics was um, what can we do to improve activity, especially uh, on CW and for newcomers. So on our flight back, um, Eddie, I, and Dominic, HB9, BBD, were thinking for, um, to make uh, something which could help to... to um, improve the activity. For us, it was uh, a little bit like a challenge to build something which was completely automatically and remotely. And um, we may add um, a standard in frequency for newcomers and also existing stations. Um, also in amplitude and timing to know whenever there is a signal and we can listen to it. And that was in four um, words what we, what we wanted to do on our uh, boring flight back. <laughs> and so the idea uh, came up. Now, before we were starting to really build a, a beacon, we uh, first said, okay, what kind of uh, equipment do we have already? And it looked like we have really quite some equipment on hand. So we had a very good uh, 3.7 meter uh, dish lying around. And then we were brainstorming a bit what, uh, what kind of power do we need. So we said, okay, let's go for somebody with a 2.4 meter, not really optimized antenna. They must be able to hear the signal out of the loudspeaker. So we started to fiddle around with the uh, VK3UM software. and We find out that with our 3.7 meter and a good feed horn, good to illuminate the dish, we would need approximately uh, 400 watts of power. Now, other points in our uh, design, we wanted to be uh, not only a beacon, just a signal somewhere there, but we wanted to have it on 1296.000, so it needed to be uh, locked to, to GPS. Also, we wanted to, to build a beacon that uh, was a kind of timing also, so th the beacon should start at each minute, also GPS locked. Of course, the beacon should have a very stable output, so people could uh, really check moon reflection conditions. And of course, the antenna must track the moon accurately. Plus, we, for ourselves, we needed to have an, a monitoring and control so we could check uh, power levels. We could check voltages, temperatures. And um, also for the user, we said, OK, let's, uh, because our beacon is not visible everywhere in the world, so we said, let's make a monitoring and control where the user can see if the beacon is up if the beacon is transmitting or maybe is in maintenance. A second challenge was uh, to find a location. So uh, we could not put it in our own backyard because then we would not be able to transmit on uh, or listen on 1296 anymore. So we needed to have a location that was safe. We knew that the air cooling was going to, to make quite some noise. So we came to the conclusion that an industrial area would be preferred or perfect because there we have less zoning conditions and um, the noise issues would be no problem. The third thing was a license. Since we uh, had a power limit of 50 watts in, uh, in Belgium on 23 centimeter, we applied for, um, for a license, for a high power license for an unmanned station. Now, we also applied for a 1296.000, and this was, in first hand, was a problem for the authorities because they say, no, you have to be up at 1296.900, where the beacon band is. So we started to convince them that uh, the EME band is starting at 1296, and we would like to have it there. Uh, at the same time, there was an, uh, or a little later, there was an, IARU uh, conference in, in South Africa, and we tried to put it on the agenda there, but we were a little bit too late to do so. So later we come back on this, but after three months we got our license. So now it was time to, uh, to start our beacon, and uh, <clears throat> so first what we had was, uh, was the 3.7 meter reflector which was on a very solid AZTL mount, on a fixed mount. And uh, the first work was to motorize this, uh, this piece of mount. So uh, 
We have a good friend uh, in our neighborhood called uh, ON5OT, and uh, he is really a mechanical uh, expert, so we talked to him if he could help us, and he was very happy to do so. So we started to make some, uh, <coughs> some bearings. This is the top bearing coming on the fixed part of uh, the mount. And then this is the movable part, which will come on here. And here we join the two together. So the fixed mount, which will be bolted afterwards on the foundation. And this part is going to, to rotate uh, the antenna in azimuth. So there you see Mark on 5 t uh, installing a, a big uh, gearbox on top of, of the mount. So this gearbox is the, uh, the azimuth gear. And uh, the axe you see, uh, oops, the axe you see coming out is, uh, is in fact attached to the fixed uh, part of the mount. So that turns the other part uh, east and west. So here you see the gearbox inside, uh, stainless steel protection, a protection for the actual uh, motor. On top here we have the, uh, the azimuth encoder. And where the two parts join together, we made a, a kind of bearing where you see 12, no, six wheels. And these six wheels turn here around the, uh, the static part to keep, it, uh, to keep it aligned. So a second part, of course, was the elevation mount. So for the elevation, we made also a fixed part with a pivot point here. And we had a very heavy-duty uh, ball screw uh, uh, actuator, stainless steel, which we completely stripped and rebuilt it again. Also made an, a protection for the motor here and the protection here that the water could not, uh, could not come in. So then we needed to, uh, to mount the encoders. This is the, the pivot point of the, uh, of the antenna. So this is uh, a brass with uh, stainless steel. And this part uh, moves up and down when the elevation of the antenna goes up and down. So here we have, uh, we have the absolute encoder uh, connected to this, uh, this pivot point. At the other side of the, uh, of the elevation, we have the, um, the limit switches in case if the electronics would fail, then the uh, motor will stop. So this is uh, the complete uh, beacon which we are building, and this is the box where the complete electronics must, uh, must be in. So the whole thing must be completely independent. The, uh, the antenna itself, it's mounted on large uh, H-beams. Then we came to the feed horn, and uh, we decided to go for a round septum feed. It's the uh, OM6AA design. And we used um, a Super V4MA shoke ring for an FD uh, 0 0.375, which the antenna was. So we, now we were ready for our first sun noise uh, test. So we, uh, we connected an, uh, a preamplifier to the feed, and we started to measure the sun noise and adjusted the feed uh, depth so to, uh, to optim optimize the position of the feed horn. So now it was ready to make our basement, so we made a, a concrete slab with uh, our H beams on and uh, with stainless steel bolts and chemical anchors. And on that we, uh, we put a 10-foot sea container. The main reason to put it on a sea container was that we had to look uh, above the fence and the trees. And also then the antenna would be up in the air about 4 meters which is okay for safety, and also because people can move around here. Um, nobody is really going to look into the feed horn or so. So by that time, we uh, finished the electronics, and it was time to pull the uh, almost two-ton uh, beacon on top of the 10-foot uh, container. So that's another picture of... Uh, of our beacon on the container, and that's the way to access it. So we have the ladder in the container, and like this we, uh, we go on top. Now, for the electronics, we uh, talked first to uh, DB6 and T2 uh, for a transverter, or for a, for a beacon transmitter. And um, Michael, he came up with a, with a solution based on his 
new generation transverter, the third generation transverter, which is uh, GPS locked or 10 megahertz locked. And he just uses the oscillator chain. So he uh, used the crystal 108 uh, megahertz, uh, multiplied it uh, times 12, uh, bypassed the mixer, and then used uh, the gain stages from the transmit part, which, uh, which is key. So we came up with a, with a very small module which delivered approximately uh, one and a half watt of uh, RF power on 1296 GPS locked. So then for our uh, final amplifiers, we needed to have uh, a driver in between. And there we used uh, one of the old Mitsubishi modules. And the reason for that was because we had uh, plenty lying around. We put that on a very large heat sink, so we didn't really need extra cooling for, uh, for this uh, preamp. And these are um, our uh, final amplifiers. What we did also is on every module, we are using connectors, not only for the RF part, but also for the DC part, in case of failure that we could uh, very easily remove it. And also every module is on a separate plate, which we can, with, four, but with unscrewing four screws, we take the whole module uh, out for, uh, for service. So these are... Um, two amplifier bricks made by uh, P1RKI, and uh, they are about 250 watt each. Um, they have two fans uh, on the intake and on the outlet, so we suck the air from the bottom through uh, the heat sink and blow it to the side out of the, uh, out of the beacon box. Same thing for the, uh, for the other amplifier. This is the inside of, uh, or part of the inside of the amplifier. So uh, each uh, brick has two devices and are combined together in, uh, in a 90 degree hybrid. So after these uh, two amplifiers we have, or in between, we have uh, the output coupler, which is also a 3 dB uh, hybrid coupler. And here we go uh, to the antenna. In the bottom we have uh, the uh, forward and, and reflected power. Uh, measurement for our monitoring and control system. These are the power supplies we are using. Uh, we had a good stock of, uh, of Aztec switched power supplies. And uh, each power supply has, uh, has two uh, outputs 28 volts, where uh, this is uh, power amplifier one, number two, and here the two outputs go to the azimuth and elevation uh, motors. So then um, we also need something to track the moon and steer the antenna. So um, I used a quite modified um, OE5 GFL um, antenna tracker based on the 89C51 ED2 uh, microcontroller um, in order to, uh, to turn the antenna with a few features. Um, we wanted to, of course, track the moon, eventually track the sun to do some measurements, stow the antenna um, whenever it's stormy or um, put it to maintenance position to access the feed or the box with the equipment. As everybody knows, the time of the real-time clock from the tracking needs to be accurate. And um, we, as we had the GPS reference uh, available, we used the GPS time to set the clock of um, the tracker. Also, the GPS timing uh, was used to start the beacon gear. We wanted to start it every um, odd, um, every start of every beginning of the minute, um, so that even if you don't hear it, you can, you know, that it should be there. If we have moon and if we are above uh, a certain elevation, we also wanted to uh, have an indication that um, the moon is above horizon. Just later on, you will see to indicate that the beacon is active. Um, we also wanted an, another another indication to show that uh, to, to know that the, the moon is above 10 degrees of elevation, because we wanted to be um, safe and also for um, license reasons, we want to transmit above 10 degrees of elevation, which is a few degrees um, above the first side lob. So there are no um, radiation issues from the ground and it was more easy to get um, the license with a little bit more power than what we may use. 
And of course, we wanted to control the um, motors um, by pulse wide modulation so that it starts and stops softly. Um, I completely rebuilt uh, and stripped down the OE5 GFL tracker to a, a, a single board um, Eurocard with DIL components um, version. And we had a few features which I already told, like above 10 degrees, above horizon, and a few other things. Um, we are using 12-bit um, MAB25 or MAB28 encoders from uh, uh, Megatron. Um, and we stripped all the hardware in the design, which was foreseen for other encoders. The gear, um, I always try to use or reuse. Sometimes I rebuild them completely. Um, systems which already exist. So I found a nice beacon gear from um, G4GNT, from Andy. And uh, with the help of him, um, we modified a bit the software um, in order to meet an automatic start um, at the top of the minute and a few other uh, uh, features. The motors uh, are DC motors on the, on the antenna for azimuth and elevation, and we control them by uh, um, pulse-wide modulation with H-bridges, which are available commercially, and um, for the price they cost, you cannot even build them. So it was better to do that. Uh, we made a, a small controller, uh, which is controlling the uh, motor controllers in order to sort, uh, soft start and stop um, when tracking the moon. Then, as I said, we would, as the beacon is, uh, is not in our garden because then we cannot operate, and uh, we would like to have a little bit of control out of um, remote control. Um, together with um, another guy, ON3 LNL, look, um, we developed um, a hardware and software, quite universal board um, with some input outputs to measure temperature, switch things on and off. Um, and um, remotely controlled through the internet. The board has a, um, um, this is the, the assembled board. It is based on an 18F45K22 processor for the microcontroller, micro, uh, microchip guys, they should be familiar. Um, and we have a, a front end which is handling the, the ethernet uh, or internet traffic. The board has, um, as I said, was universal. It has eight up to isolated inputs, um, four relay outputs, um, 12 times 10-bit analog to digital converters to measure temperature, voltages, and whatever. It has um, four outputs, two RS-232 ports, um, which are used to control the antenna controller and uh, to do a few other things. Talk to the embedded web server, which is in and it has an, an I square C bus for expansion for whatever we want to do in the, in the near future. If you go to www.on0eme.org, um, you will get this page. And um, we set it up with the microcontroller, as I said before, um, because we didn't want to have any um, operation systems um, or PCs involved. Um, just for reliability, re re and um, so we decided to do everything in a microcontroller, really um, something which is normally always working. Um, so if you go to the website, it's online, the, the ones with iPhones or whatever can do it now, you can see, uh, you have a few parameters. You can see um, whether the beacon is operational, this is something that we can set. Um, for example, if there is a failure, we can put it red, and then the beacon is not on. Second thing is, for us, is the moon above horizon. When it's green, it means it's above horizon. It doesn't mean that it transmits, because we have the license restrictions, uh, which we build in for 10 degrees. Um, so there is another um, indication, which is saying that the moon is above uh, 10 degrees of elevation. And then the fourth one, which is important, it starts to get green when the CW message starts. And the CW message starts with uh, 20 seconds of uh, sending call sign. 
Um, it has a, a 10 seconds of a um, little bit more of, of key down, and then there is silence. Um, we go to a RIX to cool down the amplifier. And then every um, zero, zero seconds uh, top of the minute, it starts all over again. And this indication follows the, the keyer. So when you think you hear it and it's green, it should be there. The only thing you have to do, you have to refresh the page manually with F5. Another thing what you can see is, see is the actual um, azimuth of the antenna, elevation of the antenna, and the calculated um, moon azimuth and elevation. Then, for our needs, we have uh, a few uh, other pages um, where we can see the same parameters, like um, elevation. Eventually, we can give uh, offsets to the encoders, if needed. We can see the Doppler. We can also see the indication moon of above horizon, above 10 degrees. We can change the beacon status. We can see if the GPS has a 3D fix as a reference for time for the exciter, etc. We can enable, disable the, the PTT and the bias and the keying. Uh, we also can see this, the status. And eventually, if we later on would like to have a longer CW message or a longer um, key down, we can go to a two-minute uh, sequence every odd minute instead of uh, one every, every minute, which is, we already have uh, foreseen that for eventually future um, applications. And then there is uh, the important thing for us. Uh, we can see temperature of uh, the amplifiers. We can see whether there is a temperature alarm above a certain uh, temperature. We can measure each voltage of, of, the, of each module. Um, we can read out forward power at the output coupler. Uh, we can read reflected power. We can check VCC, CPTT, and um, we can change remotely if we track the moon, the sun, or go to any position. And we can enable or disable the tracking uh, whenever we want remotely. It's quite helpful, especially in the beginning with some problems. Um, all the equip equipment, um, as Eddie said, is mounted in the back of the, on the back of the antenna with connectors to easily um, remove it and it served. <laughs> so this is actually the beacon um, operational where it is standing. And so as Walter said in the beginning, uh, we did have some problems. So uh, the first problem we had was on the, uh, on the output couplers. So we started the beacon on uh, April the 1st and it was not a joke, but next day, it already went down. So uh, we saw on the MNC half power. So we went to the beacon and opened the module, and well, this is what we had. So we started to repair this with uh, copper foil. The copper foil is still here, but two days later, that part of the, uh, of the coupler was gone. Next day, we had uh, the other side. In fact, this, is, uh, this was the cause. The other amplifier had uh, ATC 100A capacitors on the output, and one blew off, with the result that this, uh, this fed burned out here. And uh, we started to, to clean it up, and, and we soldered the fed again, and strange enough, the fed was still working, so uh, no problem. In several cases, these uh, amplifiers were used uh, up to eight hours with no load on it, and they survived, or the transistors survived. So we needed a, a solution for that, and the solution today is that we have a new output coupler in the, in the amplifiers, which is uh, on uh, Roger's uh, 5880 board with two-ounce copper. And, well, touch on wood, but so far, uh, for two months now, we are, uh, we are still operational. And uh, we also changed the capacitors to ATC 100Bs. Also, these, uh, this board is uh, glued with uh, silver epoxy to the aluminum to get a better uh, temperature uh, uh, stability. So this is a close-up of, of the new coupler. So, um, at, um, when we installed the beacon, uh, 
before we, we keep the antenna tracking, we had a, a quite strange uh, signal coming up, which is this one. So it was, uh, the antenna was pointed in a fixed uh, direction and we went, went home and we could hear it and strange. It was S3 and then plus 20 dB over 9. And um, so uh, we came up that the location where the beacon is, it's in, um, in an area where airplanes are approaching for Brussels. So um, it's a lot of fun. You can hear it quite hard and strong with airplane, um, air, uh, airplane scatter. So something uh, which happened. So this is how the how the beacon sounds. Um, it was the first reception at Eddy's QTH. Um, it's quite strong. You have to know, notice that it's in on a, on a 2.4 kilohertz filter. So it's not. So it's quite quite strong. And it was the first uh, reception uh, um, just the day after it was uh, was tracking. Then we got uh, a lot of uh, signal reports. We request a lot of signal reports. We still do. So everyone who has already uh, listened to it, please send us some audio files. Um, if not, try and listen. And the smallest station we got was um, uh, CS5 RID, which received it with a 1.3 meter dish. So anyone who has a lot of tropo stations are um, um, reporting. So that's um, quite nice. This is the view on the wave uh, fall from, uh, from Carlos. So the conclusion, um, the beacon is on since uh, March 31. It has been daily operational and it's now stable um, after some difficulties, as we said, um, with the amplifiers. And we had quite a good and quite a lot of, um, of reports. Now, is there more to come? Well, we are thinking about uh, adding another beacon on the same antenna. Now, to make, we only, of course, have one feed point, so we have to come up with something in one feed. And we were thinking of adding three centimeter in, uh, in this feed horn. So we spoke to Rasto and we spoke to Paul if this would be possible to inside the horn to include a second feed horn and come out to the site with. Uh, with a semi-rigid uh, cable. And at first sight, it didn't look uh, that good until uh, Paul said, uh, well, I simulated something else uh, because uh, you only have one metal part here. And we thought, okay, we do uh, Teflon or whatever to, uh, to make a cross. Uh, he simulated to make a cross in metal. And this uh, was much better. So uh, at first hand, with, with just this part, we will screw up the circularity uh, completely. But by uh, using other three metallic uh, spokes, the, cir the circularity would be more or less uh, okay. We were talking about a few tenths of uh, dB loss on, on 23 centimeter. So this was uh, the pattern of the, uh, of the feet without the uh, 10 gigahertz uh, wave um, uh, feet horn. And this is with the waveguide feet, so almost no, no change. And if we look here, the dotted line is with the 10 gigahertz feet inside, and the red line is, uh, is without. Then uh, a few words of thanks. Um, we would like to thank Anus um, for his support with modifying the tracker and especially the, the software uh, of it. And I think it's still one of the standalone references in tracking hardware. I think everybody agrees. Second thank to Marco and 5OT, which helped us a lot with the mechanical construction, and um, also um, on HF he did a lot of work. So um, he did quite a, of, a lot of work for the mechanical part. And then uh, Luc on 3 LNL, he helped uh, me with the firmware of the remote control, and especially with the debugging of it, because it was uh, quite a job to uh, get it working. Uh. And then, of course, a word of thank to our sponsor, 
who would like to stay anonymous um, for the use of the site and especially for the electric power. Um, the beacon consumes about um, how much, much Three, is it? 3,000 kilowatt hours a year. Yeah, so it's quite a lot, but thanks to the sponsor. So before we are going to ask uh, for any questions, we do have a, a question for you. So as we already mentioned on the uh, IARU um, conference in, in South Africa, we were too late to, uh, to ask for this uh, uh, beacon frequency on 129600, and the concern was with the doubler that we go below, and especially below 1296, so out of the EME band. So what has been said was more or less if you have a consensus in the EME community that it's fine to use 1296 as an EME beacon, then it's okay for, or we can bring it up next time uh, in Vienna on the uh, IARU conference. So the question is, is it okay for you to use 1296? So, okay, is it okay? Is it not okay to use 1296? So we have a consensus. <laughs> <laughs> so any questions? is moved, but the SETI beacon, W2, uh, what was it? Uh, SETI, yeah. What? ETI. Yeah, ETI, yes, uh, was active there. Mm -hmm. It's not active right now, uh, uh, no. and uh, I don't see it coming on because the person who had sponsored it has moved from New Jersey to Arizona. Mm -hmm. That was also one of the reasons we wanted to ask for that frequency. Any other, qu yeah. other questions? Let me just say, I think what you guys have done is really great, and uh, I think we all... Thank yeah. you. <laughs>